Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session on ERISA updates. My name is Sarah Busher, and I'm with the IAA, and I am delighted to introduce our panelists today. We have Brad Campbell, partner at Fagery Drinker Biddle and Reef, and Brad previously served as Assistant Secretary of the DOL's Employee Benefit Security Administration, or EPSA. Kathy Ireland, a consultant who specializes in ERISA and investment advisor issues, and Kathy was previously with the IAA. Kim Novotny, Senior Associate General Counsel with Franklin Templeton, and Kim handles legal matters related to the firm's collective investment trusts, U.S. retirement business, and high net worth business. And as I said, my name is Sarah Busher, and I'm Associate General Counsel with the IAA, and I cover uh, RISA, pension, ESG, proxy, and some other advisory issues. So, Let's move on to our agenda. We have a lot to cover today. And, um, you know, it's been a busy 12 months at the past 12 months, very busy at the DOL. And with the change in administration, we expect another busy year ahead. So what we're going to do today is cover some of the major activities recently at the DOL, including the ESG rule, proxy rule, fiduciary exemption, lifetime income disclosures, and some other updates. So with that, let's get started with the ESG rule. Kathy, why don't you get us started? Okay, Sarah, thank you. Uh, right off the bat, uh, we uh, the ESG rule is really not the ESG rule anymore. There's no reference to ESG in the rule. It's called the financial factors rule, which is what it was called before. But there are still plenty of there's still plenty of discussion in the preamble. I think like three over 300 times the, the term ESG is used in the footnotes, etc. It was published in the Federal Register in uh, November. It became effective on January 12th, except for certain provisions, which I'll talk about later. Um, its impact is prospective in that it does not retroactively apply to prior investment decisions by uh, fiduciaries. However, it does require that it, uh, these rules be applied um, on an ongoing basis as fiduciaries monitor and uh, consider whether to retain investments. So um, it, it does reach back in a way, um, but it reaches, but mostly it's forward looking. Um, I'm going to start off with an overview of the rule and, um, and mention that it, it sort of comes out of Section 404 of ERISA, which sets forth the literally prudent man rule, that's statutory, um, for ERISA fiduciaries. Um, it also implies a duty of loyalty in its requirement that fiduciaries uh, act um, solely in the interest of plan participants and beneficiaries. Uh, the first relevant subsection is B, which is more in the prudent man, prudent prudence uh, standard, um, and it's intended to be a safe harbor. So the provisions of that particular provision um, are not required, but they will be deemed to have satisfied the rules um, of, of fiduciary prudence. Uh, the major change to this rule is uh, a requirement that there be um, a comparison of the investment against uh, reasonably available alternatives. Um, this language was somewhat uh, softened from the proposal uh, by the addition of the word reasonable, um, and it was intended to uh, make sure that uh, advisors did not think that they had to basically scour the entire market to find an alternative for every investment that they uh, were, were considering. The next two subsections, C and D, are new, um, and they deal with the duty of loyalty. These are not safe harbors, uh, according to the DOL. These are requirements of all fiduciaries. So this, this is sort of, you must, uh, uh, fiduciaries must satisfy these rules. Um, under this part of the rule, ERISA investment fiduciaries must analyze investments solely on the basis of pecuniary factors. Unfortunately, I have difficulty saying that word, so <laughs> and but I'm going to have to say it a lot, so bear with me if I stumble over it a bit. A pecuniary factor is defined as a factor that a fiduciary prudently determines is expected to have a material effect on the risk and or return of an investment based on appropriate investment horizons consistent with, consistent with the plan's investment objectives and funding policy. A lot of that is sort of defined benefit oriented, but just wanted to uh, throw that out there. Um, 
As in the proposal, the preamble to this rule recognizes that some ESG factors may be pecuniary, um, but they definitely do not um, encourage that. Uh, they give two fairly ex what I would consider extreme examples. The first is that you have a dysfunctional corporate board um, and uh, that would be pecuniary. And, uh, and if the company dumps hazardous waste, that might be pecuniary. <laughs> so I think, you know, there's, there's going to be a number of things that sort of fall in the middle of those two things, but let's just, we'll just take it from there. Um, there is an exception to the uh, pecuniary factors only rule. And that is, I'm going to call that the all things being equal test. I know there's various different uh, formulations of that, but it's basically if an advisor cannot distinguish between or among various investments um, on the base of pecuniary factors alone, in this, cir uh, in, cir in this circumstance, the advisor can use the non-pecuniary factors to break the tie. Um, this exception, however, has a specific documentation requirement uh, where the fiduciary must, must specify and document why the pecuniary factors were not sufficient, uh, why, the selected, why the selected investment, no, sorry, how the in selected investment compares to alternatives in terms of diversification, liquidity, and projected return, and then also how the chosen non-pecuniary factor uh, is consistent with the interests of participants and beneficiaries. Um, I would note that the preamble states that the uh, all things being equal circumstance is fairly rare, so it's not probably something that uh, they expect to see a lot of. Um, and just to sort of throw something out um, about uh, the documentation, uh, the retention period under ERISA is generally six years, and I know in the SEC uh, Advisors Act it's five, so <laughs> um, uh, that uh, documentation will, will trigger um, that retention. The third and the final section that I'm going to discuss um, is an outright pro, I'm sorry, <laughs> discusses ESG as uh, funds and investments as part of a, a participant directed defined contribution plan lineup. And essentially uh, the same duties generally apply with the non-pecuniary factors, et cetera except that there is an outright prohibition on using certain funds as QDIAs. These are qualified default investment alternatives, which uh, an employer can set up for those employees who do not select an investment. Uh, this is particularly um, uh, common where you have an auto enrollment um, plan where the, the employees may not even be aware they, <laughs> they're, they're contributing for a little while and they have not given any direction. And there's fiduciary cover, as it, as it were, um, if the fiduciary directs these amounts into a, a QDIA. Um, under this rule, a QDI cannot include in its investment objectives or goals or principal strategies um, any pecuniary factors, any, I'm sorry, any non-pecuniary factors. Accordingly, any such funds apparently must be removed as QDIAs, and uh, the rule provides a delayed effective date um, to accomplish that, um, and, and that is uh, April 30th, 2022, and it gives them an opportunity to identify the funds and perhaps select replacements. Um, that's the general overview. Uh, the status is interesting, um, and uh, um, as you uh, probably are well aware, the, uh, there's been sort of a, well, I've heard it, the bouncing ball, the ping pong game, whatever, the, these, the, the uh, encouragement or discouragement of, of ESG type factors in uh, ERISA investments has been going on for some time. Um, there was a field assistance bulletin in 2018. Uh, this was, that was followed up by this, um, this rule. Uh, there was also an executive order that required that the DOL determine um, uh, what, uh, whether there are trends in, in investment of uh, energy sector in investments uh, by ERISA plans. Um, there was uh, some, some of the members of the audience may have received some of these. The regional, uh, some of the regions of the DOL sent out letters last summer um, asking for information about um, uh, asking advisors and plan sponsors for information about ESG investments um, in their um, in of their plans. 
Um, and then this rule, and then this rule proposal came out uh, June 30th uh, with a 30-day comment period. Along, and of course, there, as we know, there are, were two other things with 30-day comment periods, mostly almost you know overlapping. Um, so um, the IAA and many others uh, requested that the proposal be withdrawn. Um, and noted various concerns. Um, I'm going to say that you know, the classification of ESG as non-pecuniary and, and also mentioning the challenges faced by advisors that operate globally and, um, and in, some, you know, in some jurisdictions are being encouraged and uh, indeed maybe even required to consider ESG uh, factors where, um, where this, this uh, ERISA rule would not permit that. Um, as noted, the uh, rule became effective right before the inauguration. Um, I would also note that the prior guidance um, was withdrawn as, as a part of this rule becoming effective. So all we have right now uh, is that rule. Um, and uh, it's, but it, it has been specifically targeted for review by the Biden administration. Um, and uh, even though it's final, DOL action could uh, take various forms, uh, a, a temporary non-enforcement um, process, perhaps a more nuanced enforcement process, um, other sub-regulatory guidance such as uh, FAQs, that sort of thing, or the DOL could very well uh, propose to either amend it or withdraw the rule. Um, and um, that under the Administrative Procedures Act, that's going to require notice and comment. So um, that's not something that's not a quick fix for sure. Um, in short, it's final, but in flux. Um, I would say that um, advisors at this point might want to take a few actions that might um, uh, that might be helpful in general and, and could be helpful if indeed this uh, we need to start applying this going forward. Um, first of all, I'd recommend that advisors update their inventories of ERISA plans. Um, this is always a good exercise, not necessarily for this, uh, this purpose. Uh, re recall that only certain private retirement plans are covered by ERISA, so it's not applicable to public plans. So if you have public plan retirement pl clients, you generally don't have to worry about this unless um, your contracts with those uh, entities require you to follow ERISA. So sometimes they sort of bootstrap ERISA into their um, uh, into the requirements that they set for their advisors, let's put it that way. Um, these are also not applicable to IRAs or um, self-employed plans. Uh, ERISA only applies if um, if a plan has employees, and if it's an owner only, like the old-fashioned Keo plan, um, it's it's not going to be covered. Um, now, as in contrast, the uh, prohibited transaction rules that Brad's going to talk about do apply to IRAs and Keo. So, just to make life much more interesting in the ERISA world, and don't forget also that ERISA, ERISA fiduciary responsibilities may also attach to what we call plan asset vehicles. Uh, certain, such as certain hedge funds, et cetera, which, which have 25% um, uh, participation um, or 25% of the assets represent uh, involved investment, uh, ERISA investors. Um, so you might, you might need to put those in the ERISA bucket at, as well. Uh, check your agreements. Thanks. Your I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Kathy. I'm sorry. Am I out of time? No, <laughs> I just wanted to say... <laughs> Check your agreements with the ERISA clients. Um, you know they may have investment policy statements. Uh, some of these uh, agreements or policy statements may require you to consider or you know or, or satisfy a mandate to uh, to choose ESG investments. Um, you don't get cover from an, an agreement if it's uh, not allowed by ERISA. So. Uh, take a look at those agreements, um, contact the clients and the, maybe the consultants to see what, what, what to do going forward. Um, you might need to update your process, document your process, and uh, remember the process applies to going forward as well. Um, okay. And the other, the other issue is, is uh, I think we're going to maybe discuss in, in, the, in the questions, um, uh, looking at uh, your funds to see where they fall um, in if they are using 401k lineups or if you are an advisor that chooses funds or recommends funds for 401k lineups and of course the QDIA is, is the most glaring issue there that's what I've got thanks there
All right. Thanks, Kathy. So, yeah, we at the IAA have advocated for uh, a non-enforcement policy um, by EBSA so that to give everybody time to review the rule, consider the issues that are coming up. Um, and speaking of issues, I'd uh, just like to hear about what issues that people are hearing about. Kim, let's start with you. What kind of questions have you received related to this rule? The questions uh, have focused around prospectus disclosure for us. You know, what do we need to do? Do we need to take, you know, add some, some kind of language at this point? So that's still on the table for us. We're taking a look and thinking about what to do, and it'll probably take the form of a, you know, a complex white sticker if we do something if we feel we need to. But um, at, at right now, I think we're waiting to see, you know, what happens in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, that makes sense. Brad, how about you? What have you heard? Yeah, so we've been advising clients, uh, first of all, to not panic uh, and, and not panic for two reasons, uh, because one, uh, it's very likely the Biden administration is going to put a halt to this, at least temporarily, while they decide what to do in the long term. And that could happen quite quickly. So I, I, I share you know, as, as the IAA has requested, a lot of other folks have requested, and, and if you look at the executive order that the president issued, the only regulation at the Labor Department that was singled out for treatment as an environmental regulation and an urgent one due to this executive order was this rule. So it's getting high level attention from the White House telling DOL to do something about it. So don't panic, one, because I don't think the detailed rules that Kathy just went through are going to be uh, fully applicable uh, for much longer. Uh, and the other reason not to panic is technically the final rule still left us a lot of wiggle room. Practically speaking, I like to think of it as putting some new words on some old ideas. And what I mean by that is if you strip away all the, the special language, uh, a pecuniary factor is basically a factor that a fiduciary finds material to analyzing an investment within the time frame that you're going to hold that investment. So when you're considering ESG factors, they're like any other factor. Either they're relevant to the analysis or they're not. And if you had a prudent, thorough, fiduciary compliant process uh, last year for your plans, and in that process you put your ESG related investments through the same tests you put screens that you put all your other investments through, and it came out the other side as a valid investment that met your criteria, you're probably in pretty good shape. You probably don't have an immediate problem of an investment that raises a concern, even though you used a process that has different terminology than this new process we're calling for. So we've been telling folks, look, you don't have to get rid of ESG investments. ESG investments are absolutely permitted under the Trump rule itself and likely will be also warmly welcomed. Uh, that would be the difference. They will be warmly welcomed probably by the Biden administration's action, as opposed to a little bit suspect under the Trump rule. Uh, but the Trump rule still allows those investments. So you don't need to do anything to get rid of them. The other point that, that Kathy made um, that, that is a little different for this rule is that it applies on a rolling basis. So yes, it went into effect on January 12th. But if you have a planned committee that doesn't meet until June, and it won't be until June that they conduct their periodic review of the current investments, then you don't have to do anything to apply these new rules until that June meeting when you now review those investments under the new standard. So for most plans, uh, if we do get the, the action we're likely to see from the Biden administration, which is to have sort of a non-enforcement policy of some sort come out in the near future, uh, many of your plan clients will never even have had to think about implementing this rule as it currently sits. So for all those reasons, uh, don't stop doing ESG investments if you did them prudently before. Um, there's a lot still to come on this rule. Yep. All right. Well, let's move on to the proxy rule. There we go. Kim, why don't you tell, give us an overview of that? Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, so on December 11th, 2020, DOL released the final rule amending its investment duties regulation to address the application of ERISA's fiduciary duties with respect to the exercise of shareholder vote, excuse me, <clears throat> shareholder rights, including proxy voting. And by way of background, um, 
prior to uh, this amended rule, um, DOL's investment duties regulation did not spe specifically address proxy voting. Um, instead, DOL has periodically released sub-regulatory guidance on, on these issues. Um, there was the 1988 opinion known as the Avon letter. There's been um, a series of interpretive bulletins and field assistance bulletin 2018-01. Um, in terms of the reasons for this rulemaking, DOL explained in the preamble that it undertook a proxy voting regulatory project to confirm that fiduciaries, when exercising shareholder rights, may not subordinate the interests of participants and beneficiaries in receiving financial benefits un under the plan to non-pecuniary objectives. So DOL was concerned that the sub-regulatory guidance that it had provided uh, over the years had caused confusion for some fiduciaries in this area and um, consideration of non-pecuniary or non-financial factors. So DOL also expressed concern um, that the guidance they had given resulted in a misplaced belief that fiduciaries must always vote proxies in order to fulfill their fiduciary obligations. So what, what we have in the final rule is that um, Interpretive Bulletin 2016-01 has been removed from the Code of Federal Regulations, and the Investment Duties Regulation was amended to add a new paragraph on proxy voting and exercise of shareholder rights specifically. And the preamble tells us that FAB 2018-01 will no longer be considered current guidance. The final rule explicitly states that the fiduciary duty to manage plan assets that are shares of stock includes management of shareholder rights that are pertinent to those shares, such as the right to vote proxies. But it also states that the fiduciary duty does not require the voting of every proxy or the exercise of every shareholder right. In deciding whether to exercise shareholder rights and when exercising these rights, um, the rule requires fiduciaries to act prudently solely in the interests of participants and beneficiaries, and for the exclusive purpose of providing benefits to participants and beneficiaries and defraying reasonable expenses of, of plan administration. The UL cautions in the preamble that the use of plan assets by fiduciaries to further policy-related or political issues, including ESG issues through proxy resolutions, would violate the prudence and exclusive purpose requirements of ERISA. And the final rule, unless such activities are undertaken solely in accordance with the economic interests of the plan and its participants and beneficiaries. So we can kind of see there, there's um, sort of uh, some cross connection with the ESG rule that came out you know, pretty close in time. And the final rule outlines six requirements that plan fiduciaries must comply with when deciding whether and how to exercise shareholder rights. Um, so I'll just go through those quickly. Uh, first, a fiduciary must act solely in accordance with the economic interest of the plan, its participants and beneficiaries. Second, a uh, fiduciary has to consider any costs involved. Third, um, the fiduciary must not subordinate the interests of participants and beneficiaries um, in their retirement incomes or financial benefits under the plan to any non-pecuniary objective or promote non-pecuniary benefits or goals unrelated to those financial interests of the plan's participants and beneficiaries. Fourth, the fiduciary must evaluate material facts that form the basis of a proxy vote or other exercise of shareholder rights. Fifth, the fiduciary must maintain records on proxy voting activities um, and uh, exercise of other rights. And fiduci for fiduciaries that are SSU registered investment advisors, um, DOL you know, intends um, that this record keeping application be applied consistent to um, record keeping obligations under the Advisors Act. Sixth, a fiduciary uh, must exercise prudence and diligence in the selection and monitoring of any persons selected to advise or assist with the exercise of shareholder rights. And fiduciaries are expected to assess the qualifications of the provider, the quality of the services offered, and reasonableness of fees charged in light of the services provided. The process has to avoid self-dealing, conflicts of interest, and other improper influence. And if authority to exercise shareholder rights has been delegated to an investment manager, a proxy voting firm, or other person, a responsible plan fiduciary must prudently monitor the voting activities of that person and determine whether the activities are consistent 
with the fiduciary obligations and the six related requirements I just mentioned, as well as the safe harbor provision regarding proxy voting policies. Uh, the final rule prohibits a fiduciary from adopting a practice of following the recommendation of a proxy advisory firm or other service provider without first determining that that firm's uh, proxy voting guidelines are consistent with the fiduciary requirements of the rule. And the final rule also um, describes a safe harbor. Um, it provides that fiduciaries may adopt proxy voting policies, um, providing that the authority to vote a proxy will be exercised uh, with specific parameters prudently designed to serve the plan's economic interest. So once again, we have this you know, economic component and it describes two optional types of policies to satisfy ERISA's loyalty and prudence requirements. Um, the first option would be a fiduciary adopts a policy to limit voting to particular types of proposals that the fiduciary is determined are substantially related to the issuer's business activities or expected to have a material effect on the value of the investment. And in the second option, a fiduciary would adopt a policy of refraining from voting on proposals when the plan's holding in the single issuer is sufficiently small um, that the matter being voted on is not expected to have a material effect on the investment performance of the plan's portfolio. Um, the final rule requires plan fiduciaries to periodically review any proxy voting policies adapted pursuant to the safe harbor so I would say, you know, one thing to definitely take a look at is um, what's said about the, the safe harbor there. Uh, next, the rule specifies that the responsibility for exercising shareholder rights lies exclusively with the plan trustee, except to the extent the trustee is subject to the directions of a named fiduciary or there's a delegation of power to an investment manager. And with regard to pooled investment vehicles, the final rule requires an investment manager to vote proxies in proportion to each plan's economic interest in the pooled investment vehicle. The rule, however, permits investment managers to develop an investment policy statement that's consistent with ERISA and the investment duties regulation and require participating plans to accept that statement, including any proxy voting policy prior to investment in the pool. The final rule clarifies investment duties regulation does not apply to voting tender and similar rights with respect to securities passed through to participants and beneficiaries with accounts holding those securities. And uh, I would say lastly, the preamble confirms that the regulation does not apply to proxy voting by investment managers for mutual funds. Um, so compared to the proposal, um, DOL took a more principles-based approach in the final rule um, and you know, excluded some of the provisions uh, that were more concerning. Um, applicability dates, the final rule uh, became effective January 15th of this year, um, and there are some extended compliance dates there that you can take a look at, particularly on the pooled investment vehicle and um, uh, the prohibition on adopting a practice of following the recommendations of a proxy advisory firm without, you know, reviewing their voting guidelines and making sure they're consistent with um, your fiduciary requirements under the rule. Thanks, Kim. So we have gotten some questions um, around ESG and proxy and, you know, should I change things? Should I change use of ESG or can I use a third party for proxies? I think what Brad said earlier is a fair point in that, you know, the proxy rule has similar language to ESG. And when we've spoken with DOL staff, we've said, please review ESG and proxy together, you know, in terms of a non-enforcement position. So it kind of feels like we're in a wait and see mode um, at this point on both of these rules. So not, you know, making any grand changes right now, I think is, is probably what people want to do um, for the present time, because that ESG rule is specifically on the Biden list. So we know that's going to be reviewed. And we know that the staff knows that proxy has similar arguments and language. So I think uh, I think probably more to come. I think in the interest of time, we are going to move along to the fiduciary exemption. And uh, there is a lot to unpack here on the fiduciary exemption. So um, wanted to let you know that we, we think that this is going to create the fiduciary exemption is going to generate a lot of questions. So we have scheduled a webinar for March 16th and we'll be sending out uh, at the IAA more information about that soon. But Brad, why don't you get us started on the exemption? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the, the first thing that uh, advisors need to understand is that there are two big issues here that are related but technically separate. And the first is guidance that was issued by the department in the preambles, the descriptive language of the new exemption. And the guidance tells you when particularly rollover recommendations are to be viewed as fiduciary advice for ERISA purposes. So they're interpreting the 1975 regulation and its five part test. And this new guidance was oddly issued as buried in the preamble to the actual exemption. The exemption, however, is technically unrelated to that. The exemption is basically saying, if you follow these conditions, then in those cases where a fiduciary who's giving non-discretionary advice would have a conflict that would normally give rise to a prohibited transaction, it is nonetheless exempt and permissible to receive your reasonable compensation if you follow the conditions laid out uh, in the exemption. So there, there are two parts, and that's the thing I think everyone needs to always keep in mind when they're analyzing an ERISA fiduciary advice issue. The first question is, is this fiduciary advice for ERISA purposes? And then the second question, which really is separate, regardless of how good my advice was, am I allowed to give it? Is it legal or is it a prohibited transaction? And for advisors uh, who often, particularly those who are IARs, tend to think, well, I'm not conflicted because I'm a flat fee advisor in many cases, so why would I have a conflict? Uh, be aware this does apply to you in the rollover context, because what DOL has said in the guidance is, and, and this is consistent with past positions that they've taken, that if you are recommending a rollover, which is causing assets that are currently in, for example, a 401k plan, to leave that plan to go somewhere else to an IRA, for example, then you're giving advice about the assets that are currently in a plan, and this guidance says, and we'll talk about the conditions, but generally speaking, that's going to be fiduciary recommendation. It's going to be ERISA fiduciary advice. Then you're giving fiduciary advice that's going to influence your own compensation because either you're getting a new fee from assets you had not previously been involved with, or you're getting a different fee for assets in the IRA than you were charging for assets in the plan. In both of those circumstances, DOL says, you are affecting your own compensation with fiduciary advice, thus it's a form of self-dealing and illegal under ERISA's prohibited transaction rules. So you have to have an exemption that says it's okay. And so the exemption they put out is a new exemption that's not previously been available that uh, is modeled on the conditions and regulation best interest that the SEC put out last year uh, or the year before. Um, and if you follow those conditions, then you can use it in rollover situations as well as other situations to make it possible to give that rollover recommendation and be compensated despite ERISA's general prohibition on that conduct. So I took a second just to explain all that because otherwise this gets very confusing uh, very quickly, particularly for folks who think of themselves as fiduciaries under security law and therefore think that they're probably fine under ERISA as well. And, and unfortunately, that's not quite the case. ERISA has its own set of requirements that we have to meet in addition to the securities law uh, requirements. Uh, so this new exemption, uh, which uh, again is modeled on regulation best interest, was went into effect on February 16th. So just a, a week or so back, or two weeks or so ago now. Uh, and it's now available. But before you can use it, your financial institution, which is either a bank, uh, a broker dealer, an RIA, or an insurance company, uh, has to make a number of changes and work with you to implement a whole series of policies and procedures and documents to be able to use it. So what DOL said is, while this new exemption is being transitioned into, while people are adopting all the changes necessary, we're going to continue to make available a current non-enforcement policy that says the DOL and the IRS will not pursue a prohibited transaction against an advisor or other fiduciary. Um, and that, that transition policy of non-enforcement is good until December of this year. Uh, and it basically says that if you made a best interest recommendation, uh, if you had no materially misleading statements, and if you had reasonable fees, uh, 
then that'll be sufficient uh, for compliance until December, uh, by which time you either need to use the new exemption or you need to use one of the existing exemptions that may be applicable. So as Kathy said at the beginning, ERISA, ERISA is fun uh, because it always has these special requirements. Um, so we have two things. What's the new fiduciary standard uh, in guidance and what's the new exemption and its conditions? So maybe we should move on to the next slide and get into whichever of those comes up first. So this new exemption is, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Brad, I'm sorry. Okay, as the audience, there's a small delay, so we're trying to make sure we're acknowledging each other and not talking at the same time. Uh, so the new exemption is broad-based. What DOL wanted to do uh, in the Trump administration and what the Biden administration has allowed to stand is saying we want a broad exemption that can be used for a lot of different fiduciary advice scenarios. It is only available, however, for non-discretionary advice. And we get a lot of questions about what that means in the IRA context. What it means is that if you recommend a rollover, the participant has to make the decision whether or not to follow that advice in order to use this new exemption. If you're going to actively manage for the participant the assets in the IRA after the rollover, you can still use this exemption for the moment of rollover, provided the participant makes the decision about the rollover. So when they say non-discretion, they don't mean that this can't be used if your purpose is to go into a managed account. It means that the decision to roll over into that managed account has to be the participants and not the advisors. Uh, for discretionary managers, uh, again, you can be a discretionary manager after that point, but if you have the authority to say, you are going to do a rollover, I've executed it for you, you don't have to tell me yes, I make that decision, then this exemption does not apply. So it's for those scenarios where you've recommended a rollover, not where you've forced one to happen. And that gets into discussions about whether or not it's a recommendation. So in coming out with this, DOL has kept the various um, interpretations we've had before of when things that you talk to a client about are recommendations that are fiduciary as opposed to education or hire me sales talk or uh, otherwise are not fiduciary. So just a couple of examples. Uh, if you explain to a participant that they have the right to do a rollover and what the types of options available to them are, you know, leave it in the plan, roll to another plan, roll to an IRA, roll to someone else's IRA, you know, all of those types of things. If you merely explain those options and provide information, that's not a recommendation. So you wouldn't need this exemption because you haven't given fiduciary advice. Uh, similarly, if you said, uh, I'm an advisor who can be very helpful to you in deciding whether to roll over, here's my card, let's talk. Uh, that would not be considered by DOL to be a recommendation. It would just be a, a hire me discussion. Now, the problem we have, of course, is that in the real world, these all can blend together and be a little more messy. So where DOL is, is confident that their rules are clear, I think in practice, what you're going to see are uh, RIAs and broker dealers are going to have policies and procedures that they'll expect you to follow. Uh, about when you when and what you say uh, to make sure there's a clear dividing line for their own purposes uh, about which part of, of this, uh, which bucket your activity falls into. Shall we move on to yeah, the next I agree. Slide? Yes, I agree with you. I think this is going to be an area where there's a lot of questions um, as far as hire me versus the rollover. You know, when when does everything take effect? Uh, because for discretionary advisors, the rollover is going to be the situation uh, where you may likely be using this exemption. And then, you know, as part of the rollover discussion, do you have hire me discussions as well? So it, I, I do think this is an area that there's going to be questions. And I would say when the DOL came out uh, last week or a couple weeks ago, I should say, saying that this is going to go effective, they also mentioned coming out with guidance in coming days and you know, reaching out to stakeholders. So it'll be interesting to see if this is an area where they get some questions. Yeah, All what right, DOL so, said is they would issue, they might issue related guidance in coming days. And as you can tell, both of those are very open-ended phrases subject to a lot of interpretation. Uh, my personal guess is that we probably won't see guidance imminently, uh, but that is, just to be clear, that is a guess. But you know, we're in the process of the Senate confirming uh, Mayor Walsh to be Secretary of Labor. We've not yet had a nominee for the head of EBSA. Uh, 
Uh, and these strike me as positions that probably need to be filled uh, before they get into some serious efforts of, of deciding what comes next. They had to act on this exemption because it was going to go into effect on February 16th unless they delayed it. So they needed to make a decision there. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily true on the guidance that might come next. That said, they could issue some tomorrow and, and make our days very interesting. Right. We did get a question about PTE 8424, but this exemption that we are talking about now is different from that. So this is, um, so those are two different things. Yeah, so very briefly, uh, when you have a prohibited transaction situation, uh, so I'm giving a recommendation that is considered fiduciary advice. And from DOL's perspective, that would include scenarios where you and the participant, um, you recommend a rollover to that participant and both of you reasonably expect that you're going to be giving them more advice in the future about what to do after the rollover. DOL says that's the beginning of an ongoing and, and anticipated ongoing relationship, and therefore it was fiduciary from its outset, even if you haven't yet met for the second time. Uh, and the reason that's significant is there's a question about, is this a regular basis? Is providing investment advice occurring on a regular basis, which is one of the five elements of the five-part test? Um, so DOL has taken some license in, in how it interprets this, and it, the guidance is controversial when the, Biden, uh, when the Trump administration put it out, uh, and it's controversial in that the Biden administration has let it stand. But in that scenario, let's say you make the rollover recommendation, and it is fiduciary, and therefore you are affecting your compensation and you need an exemption, this new exemption, which is numbered 2020-02, so PTE 2020-02, uh, is the new exemption, and we'll talk about the details in a minute. There are existing exemptions out there that can also be used. The new exemption is in addition to other options. And so the reference to 8424, that's referring to an existing exemption for insurance contracts and annuity contracts, um, but it only applies to insurance and annuity contracts. So that may be available as an option, but only if you're recommending those types of products. Um, so one of the decisions that a lot of folks are going to face is, now that DOL has said more rollovers are going to be fiduciary than in the past, because they rescinded prior guidance that said most rollovers are not, uh, and that guidance was in 2005-23, advisory opinion 2005-23A, the Desiree opinion. DOL rescinded that to replace it with this new guidance. Uh, because DOL did that, this issue is going to be coming up more and more. And for now, at least, the Biden administration has let it stay where it is. Um, so I mentioned before the impartial conduct standards. This is under the current on enforcement policy of Field Assistance Bulletin 2018-02. And what it says is, as I said before, the impartial conduct standards, if you abide by those and in a sense pretend that the DOL fiduciary rule is still in place from 2016, the one that was vacated, and abide by the impartial conduct standards of the BIC exemption, which was vacated, then DOL and the IRS will agree that they're not going to pursue a prohibited transaction. So best interest recommendation, reasonable compensation, no materially misleading statements, that's the standard that will serve as a safe harbor of sorts until December uh, of this year. So right, and these are, the also part of, yeah, these are also just part of this exemption too, these impartial conduct standards. And I just wanted to add that in terms of best interest, and best execution on best interest, the DOL said that it would be interpreted and applied consistent with the Advisors Act interpretation on fiduciary duty as well as Reg BI for broker dealers and best X is consistent with the federal securities laws. So those are some helpful points. Right, so the new exemption 2020-02 is modeled on regulation best interest. Uh, and so as we just saw, the impartial conduct standards, those three requirements from the temporary policy, those also apply in the new exemption. But there's some other very particular steps that uh, both the financial professional and the financial institution need to do. So again, the financial institution is limited to a bank, an insurance company, an RIA, or a broker dealer. DOL did say if some other entity wants to seek to be a financial institution, they can apply, but that's what DOL is limiting it to for now. Um, both the financial professional and the entity, 
the institution have to agree in writing that they are fiduciaries to the participant that this advice is being given to. Uh, and that's significant because one, it ties both of those entities to the advice, and two, it means that you can't use this as a uh, protective measure. You can't say, well, I'm not sure if I'm actually a fiduciary for ERISA purposes under this new guidance, but just to be safe, we'll use this exemption. One of the conditions of using the new 2020-02 exemption is written acknowledgement of that fiduciary status. So that's an important uh, distinction in it. You have to make certain disclosures uh, about the fees and, and conflicts of interest. Um, you have to describe the services that are being provided. And in the case of a rollover, you have to specifically document exactly why the rollover is in the best interest of the participant. So this goes back to a theme we've been seeing for a while now, not just from DOL, but also from FINRA and the SEC. Uh, and the new regulation best interest, the new guidance for securities fiduciaries from the SEC uh, has many of these same requirements, which are when you're looking at someone and suggesting a rollover, you have to actually evaluate the plan that they're in, their situation currently, evaluate the rollover you're recommending, to a certain extent, evaluate other options that are available to that participant and then make a recommendation documenting why it's in fact in their best interest to do what it is you're recommending. And if you're recommending the rollover, uh, examples of some of the things we would expect to see making that rollover appropriate would be things like looking at the investments in the plan compared to the investments available in the IRA, looking at things like the availability of, of lifetime income, looking at things like the availability of investment advice, individualized investment advice, and looking at fees. And you have to consider fees specifically under the SEC guidance and regulation best interest rules, as well as uh, DOL. So there's a lot packed into this on kind of the conduct and disclosure side, but that's not all. Uh, and if we go on yes, to the next slide, I, you'll see some, I, yeah. I think Kathy's gonna take it from here, I think on the policies and procedures, so. Okay, I'm off of mute now. Yes, uh, one of the conditions to the exemption is uh, written policies, procedures that are established, maintained, and enforced uh, by the financial institution. And it's to uh, ensure compliance with the impartial conduct standards. Um, one main element is the requirement of mitigation of conflicts of interest, uh, that a reasonable person regarding them as a whole would conclude that they don't create an incentive to place their interest ahead of the retirement investor. So, uh, and there are examples of mitigation techniques that they drew over from uh, Reg BI. Uh, the policies and procedures specifically must include documentation of the reasons why a rollover was recommended and why is it the, why it's in the best interest of the client. And um, the uh, the preamble just discusses the situation where you have a um, that once the relationship is established, it's going to be discretionary. Uh, but before that, for the actual fact of the rollover, if you have a, you know, an otherwise level fee fiduciary, a sort of minute of the rollover is the is the issue, which is, you know, Brad had covered before. So um, that uh, and the, the various um, the documentation should include those factors that Brad discussed. Um, fees and expenses, their effect on the long term, the different services available under the IRA versus the plan, different investments, uh, whether the employer pays for some pays some of the expenses, which can happen, and uh, consideration of alternatives to the rollover. And uh, and just, just as a, a note, financial institution also retains the responsibility to periodically review these policies and procedures and to revise them um, if necessary in order to stay in compliance. Thanks, Kathy. So as, as if all this were not enough, uh, there is also a retrospective review requirement. Kim, can you walk us through that? Sure. Thanks, Sarah. So the exemption requires financial institutions, um, as Sarah said, to conduct a retrospective review at least annually um, that is reasonably designed to assist the financial institution in detecting and preventing violations of and achieving compliance with the impartial conduct standards and the policies and procedures governing compliance with the exemption. With regard to testing a sample of transactions to determine compliance, 
The final rule states that a, an appropriate retrospective review would be aimed at detecting non-compliance across a wide range of transaction types and sizes, large and small, identifying deficiencies in the policies and procedures and rectifying those deficiencies. Although the retrospective compliance review does not require an independent audit, the results must be provided as a written report to and certified by a senior executive officer. Senior executive officer is defined as any of the following, the chief compliance officer, the chief executive officer, president, chief financial officer, or one of the three most senior officers of the financial institution. The report and the certification must be completed no later than six months following the end of the period covered by the review. And the financial institution will be required to make the report, certification, and any supporting data available within 10 business days at DOL's request. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Kim. And this is not all of the exemption. There are also some record keeping requirements and um, you know eligibility provisions. There's a self-correction provision, but it gives you a taste of it. But the big point that you've probably been seeing is a lot of this um, is concerned with rollovers. And so we did highlight here again the rollover considerations. We also included in your materials an IA rollover checklist that I think, Kathy, you originally worked on. <laughs> Um, when you were at the IAA, and we'll be updating it as the DOL comes out, you know, to the extent they do come out with guidance in this area. But um, I do think it would be helpful just to get a sense from each of you of your thoughts on this area is about considerations and, and what are some things to consider. Brad, let's start with you. Yeah, so I, I think one of the things um, that you, you need to recognize is that financial institutions with which you're affiliated, your RAA, for example, are going to have to make decisions about when and how to implement this, adopt the policies and procedures, uh, and that is going to take them some time. So this isn't something that you should expect necessarily to be able to do tomorrow, uh, but rather it's going to take probably a, a matter of some months and some training and some documents for it. Um, it's also worth noting that the SEC came out with its enforcement uh, priorities for, for the upcoming year, and one of those was looking at rollover issues. Um, so we're seeing a, a interest in this issue across the board from financial regulators from the SEC to the Department of Labor uh, wanting to look at these issues. So I, I think it's particularly appropriate that advisors remember that these checklists, uh, these documentation requirements uh, are real, and that it isn't something you can just sort of simply say, well, yeah, the rollover for this person, you're going to have to explain why, despite what may often be higher fees, the rollover is better for this person. And I think that's very defensible. I'm not saying anything negative about that, uh, but it does mean you're going to have to actually show that documentation, show your work to an extent that um, may not be as common depending on you know, what role you play as an advisor. Thanks, Kathy. How about you? Oh, I think you're on mute, Kathy. Um, yeah, I, I think. I mean, I think the. I know, but the IAA I, we we recommended that folks would document this stuff, at least for SEC purposes. You know, just because. Um, they, they've been interested in this ever since the DOL fiduciary uh, rule, you know, 10 years ago was first <laughs> proposed. Uh, it hasn't always made it to their uh, exam priorities, but it definitely has been something that, that folks have looked at. Um, so the, uh, the documentation that has to be given to the client, um, I, I don't know that that's you know, spelled out, but I would think that uh, you'd want to go over the factors that led, led you to, you know, uh, recommend that that a, that a rollover happen um and um you know maybe the checklist you know, just to say this is these are the factors that you should be looking at um you know the other thing is that someone someone actually raised this question about what if, what if the client just comes to you and says i want to do a rollover period you know end of story and um that you know that very well may be not a recommendation so you know it you know there's all sorts of different uh, circumstances that can that can can arise in this context, but that's that's what I'd say. That's a good point. And Kim, you were saying that rollovers is really where you see this the exemption being used uh, at your firm. 
Yeah, that's right, Sarah. I think that's um, the main area of focus for us. So, you know, over the next several months, we'll be, <clears throat> excuse me, dusting off the rollover checklist that we've got and seeing, you know, how they need to be tweaked, revised, et cetera. And, um, you know, taking a look at, at how it needs to change. Great, I think thanks. one of the yeah, other one things I've been thinking about is, you know, how how do we make sure we get all the data points um, needed to, you know, document everything in terms of fees and expenses and the level of services and what are the investment options available uh, to the client on their existing plan. So, you know, we might need some to walk the client through how to get that information to us or, you know, find it elsewhere, wherever we can. So just kind of starting to think about some of those data points and, you know, if there's anything additional that um, that is new there. Yeah, I think that last point is a very good one because one of the real world frustrations we've heard from a lot of advisors is the participant wants to have the conversation now, but we don't have their 404A5 disclosure, which shows what options are available in the plan, not just what they're invested in. We may or may not have their quarterly benefit statement uh, right at hand, which shows how they're individually invested in the plan. Uh, and those are kind of at a minimum the two documents you need to really understand what's available to the participant and what they're using in the plan that, that's currently there. So a real world issue is if we ask for that and they won't provide it, how do we proceed? And I think different institutions have different answers to that question, but it comes down to these differences in policies and procedures. Um, how much you know back and forth is necessary to meet your internal standard which is probably your institution's interpretation of how to apply these broader rules. And so we may get more clarity as we get guidance or answers from the Biden administration, uh, but either way, your, your institutions are going to have to make decisions about your particular your conduct. Um, one last thing that might be worth mentioning is just clarifying that the rules here, as, as you said earlier, Sarah, apply to both plan to IRA transactions, rollovers, but also IRA to IRA rollovers or IRA to plan rollovers. The difference gets into which part of the rule applies. So just briefly, if I'm rolling, recommending you leave a 401k and go to an IRA, that's a fiduciary recommendation which has its own ERISA duty of care, a fiduciary standard to meet, as well as the exemption. If I'm making a recommendation from IRA to IRA, then it's not assets in an ERISA plan, but it is still subject to the tax code's prohibited transaction rule. So you still need to follow the exemption requirements if, you know, if, if an exemption is needed, even though you don't have the ERISA standard of care applying. And so this, this all gets a little confusing, I think, for folks, uh, but it does raise some questions to think about on compliance. And for those of you who are constructing compliance processes, do we have a different level of concern or do we want a different process for planned IRA rollovers than we do for other IRA transfers? Or do we want one process that we use universally um, that works well for all of those? And these are some of the practical issues that need to be sorted out between now and December. Yeah, definitely a lot to unpack here. So, um, so as I mentioned, we are going to have a webinar in a couple weeks to talk further about it since we believe there's going to be more questions coming up. All right, let's move on to something that came up in the SECURE Act, and um, that is lifetime income illustrations. Brad? Okay, well, I'll jump right into that. DOL put out a what's called an interim final rule last September. An interim final rule is a regulation that if they don't change it, will go into effect as written. In other words, you'll have to live with it the way they wrote it, but they've reserved the right to issue a change to it in a final rule. Uh, so DOL took comments in September on this requirement from the SECURE Act, uh, and the Biden administration therefore has the ability to make changes directly through a final rule if it wants to without taking additional comments. And in a nutshell, what this rule requires is that the account balance in a participant's uh, defined contribution individual account plan, that account balance at the end of the year is then used to project uh, both an individual and a married uh, annuity calculation in essence that assumes this participant is 67. 
Uh, and that's uh, both a requirement and a safe harbor in the, in the way the rule is structured. So you have to make the projection. And if you use DOL's preferred structure for making it, then you're going to have a fiduciary safe harbor for that process. The problem that, that I think a lot of commenters said is, well, how useful is that? If someone's 25 years old and they have $5,000 in their account, are we really going to give them a, a disclosure that says you're 67 with $5,000 and you get $12 a month in retirement income? And what is that going to mean to them? And who are they going to ask to understand what it means? Is it going to disincent them to participate or is it going to encourage them to increase contributions? There's a lot of questions about that. Uh, the rule also does not give the safe harbor for using the actual lifetime income policy in the plan. So if the plan has a real process that's in place, giving a projection based on that actuality um, is not eligible for the safe harbor. So there's a couple of questions that, that people have gone to DOL on, and I'm not aware that the Biden administration has given any indication yet on, on what their plans are. But as it's written, I think this rule is likely to cause a lot of questions for advisors from plan participants. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time, but we did want to take your questions on the fiduciary exemption and the other rules since we knew uh, those were hot topics. And I would just like to sincerely thank uh, Brad and Kathy and Kim for your participation on this panel. We really appreciate it.